Greetings and welcome. We are in Junior English. And uh, our objective now for the hour is to work with several poems uh, of 20th century poets. We're going to begin with the great W.H. Auden on 774, and uh, then we'll work forwards then uh, through the next few pages along with maybe the poetry of Cummings. I want to make a general observation about the modernist poet coming to terms with the inherent alienation produced by, in large measure, the age of technological advancement. Now that's a mouthful, so let's break it down. Why would technological advancement lead to societal alienation? Why are those two things necessarily symbiotic? Mr. McAfee, why? <coughs> why would cell phones make us less connected to each other, even though we spend all of our time on them connecting to other people. We get way too into our own little world, I guess. I don't know. Alienation has a lot to do with that. The extraction from the, from the rest of the world. Now, if you're reading with me on 774, there is a little bit of background behind this poem that will help you. Are you reading it with me? Yeah. Auden will write this poem five years after the Social Security Act of 1935. So that's the first thing you want to write down about this poem. Of course, you probably know anything about the Social Security Act. You know about your Social Security number, right? That is to say, every single person given a number. And in this moment, Auden says, this is the picture of the future that's coming. Not healthy. Definitely disturbing, definitely unsettling. Everyone's going to begin to kind of look more increasingly like a number. Everyone well, maybe is a number. To most leaders, people already look like numbers. When this poem is written, if we're five years after 1935, well, we're talking about, yeah, what's significant that's happening on the global stage by the 1940s? Right, we've got another major round of genocide and well, war about to happen, don't we? And in so doing, Mr. McAfee's dead on, rulers have a tendency to already see large numbers of people as nothing more than number. I want you to jot down, though, we're going to listen to this poem read professionally, but I want you to jot down this question. As you go through these lines, what is ironic in this poem, okay? So what is ironic, let's just listen to the poem now, follow along, and when you see lines that are noteworthy for their irony, jot them down. Known Citizen by <coughs> W.H. Auden to JS07M378. This marble monument is erected by the state. He was found by the Bureau of Statistics to be one against whom there was no official complaint. And all the reports on his conduct agree that, in the modern sense of an old-fashioned word, he was a saint. For in everything he did, he served the greater community. Except for the war, till the day he retired, he worked in a factory and never got fired. But satisfied his employers, Fudge Motors, Inc., yet he wasn't a scab, or odd in his views, for his union reports that he paid his dues. Our report on his union shows it was sound. And our social psychology workers found that he was popular with his mates and liked to drink. The press are convinced that he bought a paper every day and that his reactions to advertisements were normal in every way. Policies taken out in his name prove that he was fully insured and his health card shows he was once in a hospital but left it cured. Both producers' research and high-grade living declare he was fully sensible to the advantages of the installment plan and had everything necessary to the modern man. A phonograph, a radio, a car, and a frigidaire. Our researchers into public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of year. When there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. He was married and added five children to the population, which our eugenist says was the right number for a parent of his generation. 
and our teachers report that he never interfered with their education. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we should certainly have heard. I want to ask this question to begin for your annotations. Who is the we? Who is the we? Ain't so. But that's funny, see, because we kind of think of it as we the people, right? The opening lines of the, uh, of the, the important American founding document of, you know, in order to form a more perfect union, blah, 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 right? But who is the we in this poem? Go back to the final lines. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Colon. Had anything been wrong, we certainly would have heard. We who? The government. Now, what's interesting about we being the pronoun affixed to represent the antecedent of the pronoun government? Wouldn't it be it if it's a government? Right, this is definitely Orwell, this is definitely 1984's Orwell, this is so. definitely the notion of Big Brother, that is to say, we are always watching you. And we are aware of what is happiness, what is freedom. What's ironic about this poem? They like know a whole bunch of stuff about them, but they don't even know the name. The title of the poem is, What Citizen? Unknown. Notice, we, whoever that is, big brother, whatever, know all kinds of intel about this person, but Miss Kennedy points out, don't seem to know much about the individual. Right? What is it that you have to have to be a modern man in this poem? Did you see it? Did you write it down? What are the things you got to have? Got to have your refrigerator. What else? You gotta have your car, you gotta have your certain number of kids. If this poem was written about someone today, what would be the requirements? Are they the same? Or are they or have they changed since 1940? I mean TV was a big dog deal at that era. What would it be today? An iPhone? Yeah. You gotta have your iPhone or you're not a happy person? I don't know. Uh-oh, you're not a happy person? You're not free? <laughs> You're not a modern person? If we say MacBook, would you be mildly offended? That is to say Apple products. Appearance costs. What is it that these companies have kind of figured out in their advertising that Auden was already on to? Think about that. Are you talking about modern? Yeah, modern, modern, modern companies like Apple and other companies. They kind of have figured something out in their advertising. Think about how their advertising works to try to convince you that you can be free and you can be a unique person. You got it if you pick their product because everyone else is picking their product. Therefore, for you to be free, you also must pick their product. Note the irony here, right? Auden was in some ways a prophet who kind of saw what coming. What did he see coming, do you think, about our society at large? Lack of originality. I was just having this conversation with a group of seniors last hour, and we were talking about the fact they'd been in school for 12 years. Some of them longer. If you add to that the expectation of post high school for four or five years, that means you could be in school for 17 years. I mean, good heavens, that's a long time. Was that educational process, you've been in it now up through the 11th year, was that supposed to make you more free? That process. Memorize this. Was it to make you successful financially? Yeah. Is that what it was about? No. What was it about? Dude, you've been doing it for 11 years, so what was it for? Or are you inclined to agree with one of my juniors that said, 
it was so that you could become an unknown citizen. Or you could become like proof rock, do I dare disturb the universe? Does our education make us more homogenous? More cookie cutter like everyone else? Or rather, is our education about making us unique individuals? The way they used to say it in third grade, we're all our own person and we can become whatever we want. It depends if you have a history or not. It depends on the questions you're asked during your education. Does it, is that what it comes down to? Your educational system. Whoa, you even use the word system. Like public school, they're just kind of trying to match numbers that the government told them. Gastala said it with this inflection. Public. No, have you ever talked school. to someone that goes to private school and tell them that you're in public school and they look at you like you've been left? Like, are you suggesting that people who have been, are you suggesting that people who have been educated in private institutions have a tendency to look a little bit down? You can't look down if you're Well now, well now, wait a minute. Um, does it work the other way? And do students who come out of public institutions, public schools, have a tendency to look at students in private education as being something a little bit? Seriously? I am not interested in your experience. Does it work the other way? Does the knife cut both ways, Gustavus? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? It has a tendency to. It doesn't have to be that way. What is the, what is the whole thing about, about private education? What, is, what do you think is fundamentally there, underlying it all? Money. Is it... Gustavus <laughs> is asking... <laughs> Did you notice that Ms. Ermintrout even went like this as she said that? I do not. Uh, <laughs> it does seem that uh oh, Mr. McAfee even smiled at that point. Uh, it, it does. It does seem to appear that private education wants to somehow undercut public education. It's almost like there's this unspoken thing. We can do it better, or we have a better understanding of what education is about. So are you speaking from personal experience, or...? <laughs> I am a victim, I mean a product, <laughs> of one or two years of private education. Hurt. It seems to me that Auden would suggest that all education is going to hurt on some level. Or is that true? Yeah. I mean, real education. Any real education is going to be painful? Why? Why can't it all just be fun? Because if you tell somebody something, they probably will just be like, oh, whatever. Da, 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 da. In other words, sometimes... But then when they like, you know, like step on the mousetrap that you warned them about, they're like, I guess I won't do that again. So education is about warning about mousetraps, to continue your metaphor. Yeah. So education is not the mousetrap. Education is about, <laughs> one, is about warning about the mousetrap. Like the it's like making so in other words, education is the solution, not the problem. Education is the fly swatter? Education is the fly swatter, not the one wielding the fly swatter. Yeah. Maybe. Or are you the fly? Oh, we're, we're definitely the, the flies. Oh, we're like in the proof rock, we're all in the little thing. In proof rock, things. we're back to 3A observation. Like, in proof rock, we're stuck on a little bug display, wriggling on the wall. And he says, and when I am wriggling on the wall, how shall I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? Whoa. That's kind of a pathetic view. Is Auden's view kind of a pathetic view of society at large? Is there any way to be happy and to be free and still be a part of modern culture and society? Can you do it? Can live in the woods? Live away. The Thoreau answer. Don't be a part of society, but rather a part away the from society. The Unabomber's answer, yes. Say it again. The okay. Unabomber's answer, yes. Yeah, we have examples of any number of lunatics, patho you know, pathologies run deep here, that often will refer back to texts like this one. The Unabomber comes to mind in his manifesto. That it was, it was texts like this that already were showing that culture is doomed. Because everyone thinks the same, does the same. We're all kind of forced into certain kinds of patterns. Can you have society, though, without these patterns? You're going to have, you're going to have by society. the waters of Babylon, going the opposite direction. Hmm. So what's the solution, then? 
I know a solution. Yeah, like Uri e. Cummings. Longer. Let's go there. Cummings is an interesting poet, so let's take a look at his work. Now, I think as sophomores, we actually saw a Cummings oh, offering when we were when we were uh, a year ago. And now that we've changed textbooks, we're looking at a different set of offerings. That's my recollection, although I could be wrong about this. What do we want? Uh, the Cummings offering. I want to say um, "Anyone Lived." I think was the poem that you. No. Maybe. I I know I know. See, it's been a while uh, for me with different books, and so I always forget which one. Does you have an old book? I could look later and I can tell us. The, let's talk about Cummings for just a second. He really is the poet who tries in his poetry to prove that you can be free, that you can be unique, that you can be different. And in the process of doing so, he takes a lot of heat for it. People will often report they really don't like his poetry very much because it's so hard to read, it's hard to understand. Let's go ahead and say it out loud. He plays games with syntax. He plays games with word order. He plays games with punctuation. And he forces you to have to sometimes slow down to understand what it is that you're reading. At 2B, jot down really quickly, what do you see of value of a poet like this? What do you see of value of doing this kind of game? Is there anything really of value, do you think, of doing this? How does one become a professional reader? Yeah. Uh, we are often just asked to do that kind of work by virtue we, of the interpretive we? reading that we do. A lot of it has to do with the capacity to read in such a way that understanding is enhanced. Do you have a certificate? Oh my god, you're a professional there's, reader? There are certificates, <laughs> I suppose, that can be made on a Mac PowerBook. <laughs> <laughs> so, do they have any of those little like CDs? Or an or Airbook. How's that? I'll be democratic in my designation of Mac products today. How's that? Alright, here we go. Old age, right? Let's listen to this one. Old Age Sticks by E.E. E. Cummings. Old age sticks up keep off signs, and youth yanks them down. Old age cries, no tress and pass. Youth laughs, sing. Old age scolds, forbidden, stop, mustn't, don't. And youth goes right on growing old. Uh, this is an interesting poem. By the way, I, I think they pointed out to you before that um, Cummings has been with us from the beginning. What do I mean by that? Maybe Ermintrout is feeling a little bit weird right about now when I say Cummings has been with us from the beginning. Maybe she can feel his breath on her back. See, I'm getting hints. Um, okay. Oh, he's behind on the painting. Oh, okay. No, maybe that was oh, that guy? Is it right? Yeah. <laughs> One of my students many years ago, so impressed by the poetry of E. Cummings that he decided to produce a work of art that That's ended so up cool. staying on a wall in 303 for a number of years to follow. And so he's been looking at Ermintraut's back of her head all this time. He's been here the whole time. And in some ways, it's almost as if Cummings will serve as a powerful model or reminder to students that you can find ways to say something without doing it in, its, in the traditional approach. Let's look at this poem as a classic example. What does he say in this poem? Can you refine it to a single line? Old people are oh, Keep going, though, because this isn't a poem about old people. Look how the poem like, ends. Young people You're right. This is as much a poem about young people as it is about... It's about Good. people, period. Keep going. Growing period people. meaning what? Young people growing period people four versus growing period out. five. Change. Stages. Sort of. Life. Life. The circle of life. Irvin Trout and Carver are taking us to uh, Lion King and all of that. But this poem seems to me to be a far more radical statement than simply young people turn into old people. What is going on in this poem? Young people are happy and old people are all 
Because the old what? people make them grumpy, and then they make the young people grumpy, and then they're old people, and then they make they the make young, young people, people grumpy. The opening lines, old age sticks up keep off signs. Oh, on the grass, right? Like you put keep off Literally grass. and metaphorically. <laughs> Question, and this is an interesting and a disturbing one. At what point do you believe you move from young to old? Is it? Is it? I'll ask a series of guiding questions. Is it a function of chronology? Is it age? Is it a function of status? When I certain when I when I enter a certain status within society, I have a career job, I own my own house, blah blah. blah. Is it a function of attitude? Whenever you start getting tired. Is it a function of fatigue? That is to say, energy. What is it? How do you know when you're old? What would Cummings say in this poem? When you put stick, keep on. There you go. That's right. In other words, when your relationship with the young is what? Qualify it. For Cummings, you know you're old when your relationship with the young is what? What's the adjective you'd want to use? Bellicose. Warlike, acrimonious, putting up signs, right? In what ways has this poem probably, do you think, been read by younger generations as license to boycott, as license to do sit-ins, as a license to say, old people don't get us, collectively, young? Yeah. This poem is kind of revolutionary. Look at the final lines of the poem. Right? They go right on growing old. Do you think it is inevitable that you will someday become a grouchy old woman? I don't want to be grouchy. I will be grouchy. I ask, do you think it's inevitable? Just because you get old does not mean you have to get grumpy? Let me ask it this way. I'll make it easier for you. You are... What's with all these personal questions? Anytime that I can... That I can, uh, I can <laughs> what do you mean you're already grumpy? So question. When you look at your own experience... You're 11, 11th grader, almost a senior, just a few hundred days away from being a senior. Do you feel like you are more grumpy than you were when you were a freshman? Yeah. Yes. Wow. No way. No, definitely not. Oh, yeah. Yes. So you've become less grumpy as you've gotten older. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. So do you feel like this is, now next question, do you feel like getting grumpy and old is a personal choice? Yes. Or is it kind of just the inevitability of aging? Your body ages, your eyes get weaker, everything kind of starts to sag and bag. We've had that conversation. Yeah, like some people You can choose otherwise. You can choose to feel young. No, Even no, though you get old. Like, They're just like happy. happy. Like, you don't have to feel grumpy. You can be like, Why do you think old people often are grumpy around young people. But why? What's the source of it? Is it jealousy regarding what? Because no. like, when they sit down, they can get back up. <laughs> they they are jealous about the physical limitations. <laughs> yeah, like young people young people have freedom that yeah. old people maybe they don't get to enjoy. Old people. Yes. Meaning like that. I think that's like it branched off in the very beginning when it was like the elders are always more responsible because they've had all this life experience, so they know what to do and what not to do, and so that just kind of led everybody to believe they were the authoritarian figure, and now for some reason they're bad. So old people have authority, young people don't. No, it's like it's perceived authority. It's not necessarily. Is it a function that young people are always wanting to overthrow the authority of old people? Is there an inherent dialectic? I'll say it this way. A student I was teaching this poem to said it this way. I was my mom's best pal when I was younger. 
coming up into middle school, we were best of buddies. We go to Billings and go shopping together. We had so much fun. We finished each other's sentences. I mean, we understood each other. We totally got it on every count. It was beautiful. And then I became a seventh grader. And things started to change. And by the time I was in freshman high school, me and my mom were butting heads seriously. She didn't like the fact that I had my own opinions. I was going to do certain things she did not approve of. She always had this instruction for me. Some of it I listened to, some of it I completely ignored. And when I ignored it, she got really hostile and mad. Is there an inherent... I have so, that really I feel like my that grandma. Me and my mom, when I was really little, I was kind of a problem yeah, child, and we butted heads like really bad. It, like, it's the inverse. Really, really You're saying bad. it's the inverse, and now, See, now you really get along. Yeah. But I get along with they my mom despite it's my grandma that I fight with because she expects me to be a lady and have to depend on guys. And she really mean to me that I have yet to get a boyfriend. This, this notion <laughs> of the expectations <laughs> has something to do with it. Do you think it's do you think it's different today being a parent and a kid than it was a hundred years ago? Well, a hundred years ago it was more like you could die tomorrow of Certainly there were certain issues regarding health and finances. Hundred years ago you don't go just get a job at a Big Mac, for example. It's a different culture, economically speaking. Do you think young people have less respect today yes. for the older? Yeah, I don't think yes. they have yes. less respect. They have, the they have less fear. They have less respect. You know. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's put this in our notes because this is a very interesting dichotomy you've created. You're saying it's not a function. You do realize that most adults today will report that they believe most young people have less respect for them and their authority. But I'm hearing you say, it isn't so much that there's less respect, it's that there's less fear on the part of young people towards adults. It's like back then, you know, you cross your mother and she would not hesitate in the oh, my mom, my But mom, nowadays, my you know, 911's on the other end of that phone at any second. You, you know how many kids unnecessarily call 911 a day? You're saying kids are more that. free? Yeah, yes. because they Break have the razor strap. We got spankings. You're saying, you're saying kids, you're saying kids want to be less restrained? They naturally fight against any restraint. So that's a function of being young. You're saying it's a function of being old to stick up signs. Show restraint. Notice the sign here is a metaphor for this is the limit. You can't go beyond this. I mentioned a few seconds ago by the Waters of Babylon, a text we studied a couple of years ago, and you'll remember that in that text there are rules that are set in place by the adults, the authority figures, about where you can and cannot go. Notice in the story it's a young boy who violates those rules and goes into a place where he's not supposed to go. Do you think it's kind of natural that young people want to push against the limits imposed by adults? And do you think that, if that's the case, then why is it old people are so offended by it then? Because they, they, them, the they themselves did the same thing. Notice the end of the poem here, right? Young people become old people. But if you look at it, you know, so the kids whose parents are like, you know, don't let them do anything ever are usually the ones that act out more, the ones whose parents don't restrain them as much. Now this is fascinating. The more signs you put up on the grass, to just continue your metaphor, it seems the more footprints land on the grass. Yeah. In other words, telling a young person not to do something seems to be Maybe the key to making sure that they do it. Because we don't like to be told what to do. Don't tell me what to do. It's kind of like the same on both sides. Because How so? Like, it works the other way. How so? One, <laughs> either one looks look to the other one and they think they, they, they know everything. Fascinating. And, and Mr. McAfee even was somewhat animated as he said it. They think they know everything. But it seems to me, and Mr. McAfee suggesting this, that both young and old have this view. Wait a minute. Is there stuff young people know that old people don't? Yes. Like, how do you do the Like, there was this lady on this, this show that didn't know what a noun was. She was just so old. Got it. 
They didn't have nouns back in the day. <laughs> back in the day when there were no nouns. Jeez. That was, that was hard to speak without any nouns. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. I get it. So, question. What kind of old fart will you be, do you imagine? What, what kind of old fart will you be when you get old? When will that happen for you? Carver, when will you be old? I don't know. When will they finally look at you and say, You're old. But they don't. I tell my mother. So, when will you look in a mirror, Myers, and say, Oh, I think I am kind of I'm old. old. Kids Will that be when, when you're a certain age? I didn't age? know one thing they wanted. Like, I, I think didn't understand what was life I was going to Google it. It, 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 it depends on how much garbage you've gone through. Old, but she feels old because both of her kids are in jail. <laughs> it's a function of feeling that you're either successful or failure is to be old? Do you think we give the proper respect to the old today that we should? Not all of us. Not all of us. Like, well, I thought you were going to say how some of those freshmen talk to their seniors. Now, wait a minute. When you were a freshman, did you show respect to seniors? I was not to seniors. Uh, well, what do seniors get a government? Uh, four years older than me. Wait a minute. You're just a few days away from being a senior. You may want to think about this. I'm not a I don't know. I'm pretty I just didn't want to push their buttons because then I didn't want them to. So if, so if a freshman is not going to show respect to a senior... Yeah, I know. Well, it all depends. Are you like, hey man, I'm Mr. Rex, but you children. But I have no appropriate... You know, years ago, they used to have a thing called initiation. <laughs> and for one day, seniors could do all kinds of nasty things to freshmen. Seriously? Yes, yes. They did all kinds of nasty things. They would go and get them in the morning, and then they would make them put peanut butter in their hair and drink pickle juice and stuff like that. When was it? They had to do the one You had to do this. Yes, you had to do this. Or you got, you got jacked, you see. Thank you.